This conference will now be recorded. Off the dome, man. You know, most people like to prepare, but... Hey, hey, we freestyling in here, you know what I'm saying? I, hey, hey, I guess so. I guess so. I need some preparation for myself, but let's get into it. Let's get into it. Um, well, let me go ahead and hit that intro, and then we'll, uh, like I said, jump in. It. So, hey, guys, what's going on? This is Pat Brown. I'm a financial advisor uh, with Edmonds Duncan out of Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, played football for the University of Kansas many, 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 many moons ago. Uh, loved my time there uh, immensely. Met my college sweetheart there. Had a great time, uh, met a lot of great people. And along the way, became very passionate about financial literacy for student athletes, I think is uh, vital and important, especially now that uh, we have NIL uh, that has uh, a little bit over a year, we're into it. And so I just think it's important to get guys exposed to it. And I hopefully uh, with interviewing former student athletes, um, maybe some of these guys can kind of learn from the pitfalls that happen uh, with guys that have gone before them so that's my thoughts that's my hopes um you know certainly you guys can see who i'm, I'm interviewing here beside me if if, if uh, the guys in lawrence don't know what this is you must be sleeping on a rock this is the uh, one and only wayne simeon um wayne i uh, let me go ahead because i have to you know I do some cyber stock and i mean i know everybody knows who you are but i'll, uh, I'll skip the intro man don't go no don't read the resume no we we got, you know, uh, high school, Mr. Kansas basketball, 2001, uh, All-American Parade, All-American 2001, McDonald's All-American 2001, uh, Big 12 Player of the Year 2005, Third Team All-American 2004, Consensus First Team All-American 2005, got drafted, what was it, first round to the Miami Heat, NBA champion. Uh, so I guess, you know, from a career standpoint, you did all right. It wasn't too bad. Man, had, had, had a good career, was very thankful to have some amazing coaches and teammates uh, in that. And, you know, you started out this segment uh, with how long ago your career was. And you <laughs> threw about five minis in there. I'm going to add about three to mine, not, yeah. not as many as you, but uh, <laughs> many, many, many moons ago uh, yeah. is when I was able to do all those things. But I'm excited to be back at the University of Kansas, still heavily involved. Uh, on the campus and with the program and with this uh, next generation of student athletes to make sure they have a, uh, a college experience that helps them flourish in every part of their life. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, one of the things I want you to just right off the bat uh, touch on is just the definition of financial literacy. Um, definition is basically the possession of a set of skills uh, and knowledge that allows individuals to make informed and effective decisions with all the financial resources. Why do I say that? Um, I just want to get that out in the open because a lot of times, especially with me when I was young, financial literacy had kind of a bad connotation. You know, making, uh, as far as an athlete, that stereotype, athletes are dumb, they don't understand this, they don't understand that. And so I just want, you know, guys that are, are listening and watching to understand that it's not that anyone is dumb, it's just you don't have the exposure to it. And again, that's what I hope by these interviews is just to kind of expose guys to just different basic, basic, basic stuff. And so again, uh, we have Wayne, and I just want to start out with the first question is, um, you know, when you first started at KU, freshman year, um, tell me about your thoughts about money as a freshman in college. Yeah, well, before I get to that that question, Pat, which is a good question, man, I, I want to talk a little bit about the definition that you just described. It, it's financial because I, I think that's really important. And that's there was today. a word that you said there uh, that goes overlooked when it comes to this uh, notion of literacy, and it's the word skill. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not just information. Uh, it's not just know-how, but it's actually the ability to apply that information and know-how to real-life situations and settings. And so when you think about the word skill from an athletic context, right? Because we both sure. come from that. We did not yep. automatically just show up on the football field and the basketball court with the skills that we needed to, you know, compete at a collegiate level. We had to start out with a very small foundation and framework, uh, some coaching, uh, right. some peers, and to be successful in doing some of those small foundational um, you know, movements or, you know, principles over and over and over again. You know, that's, it's, that, that's it's, no it's, it's no different in financial literacy, right? Like, man, yep. it's a skill that needs to be developed. It's not just a course that you take or a video you watch or a seminar that you are exposed to once and then you've got it all figured out. 
There has yep. to be the daily use, the daily appropriation of that information so you can actually have uh, the skill and being able to apply it in, in an effective way. And, and, and to your question, that's something that I certainly did not have when I arrived uh, at the college campus. And again, it wasn't because I didn't have the, the information behind uh, the importance of, of saving and writing checks and being generous and, um, you know, not spending beyond your means. Uh, it's just because I hadn't had the, uh, the, the ability or the opportunity to be able to test some of those skills out. And that's one of the things that I was thankful for in my college experience. And, and as you mature in your 20s and you start to uh, maybe get your first job or you're able to get your first income is to be able to grow those types of skills uh, uh, in that in that context. Absolutely. I definitely appreciate you kind of diving into that a little more. Again, if if we start looking at and analyzing, you know, sports and there's, you know, financial literacy, I mean, they really do go hand in hand. You just have to learn those skills and get those repetitions uh, over and over and over. Um, so when you were coming up, growing up, if you will, uh, did anyone ever kind of take you aside and talk about those things as far as credit, as far as budgeting, as far as investing, of anything of that nature? Yeah, uh, maybe not to that detail. Uh, I'm very thankful for my parents, uh, who I think gave me a, a really good foundation and, and view of money. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, both of them were factory workers. They both worked at Hallmark Cards uh, for over 40 years. So, you know, my first key principle to uh, to money was number one, you work for it and you work hard for it. You know, yeah. there's no, uh, get rich quick schemes. There's no shortcuts to, you know, generating wealth or, or being able to provide financial stability for yourself and your family. You show up every single day to work and, mm -hmm. uh, and you do what's required. You do what's asked of you. And so, uh, that was a foundation that I'm so thankful. You know what? Even though that foundation was given to me decades ago, Pat, it yeah. still works, my man. It still, it still works, works even today. <laughs> Try and true. The very first dynamics of, of financial literacy is, is you got to put the work in, my man. You got to put the you gotta work show in. Up. Um, you gotta show up. And so that was something that was uh, that was uh, given to me. Then also, you know, you want to take care of your your, your money and, and live within your means. Um, mm -hmm. You know blue collar family and we lived really a blue collar lifestyle, um, you know, and they were still, you know, the pull and the um, and, uh, you know, the trapping of wanting to, you know, compare yourself to your neighbor and have the, the, the coolest, the stylish, uh, you know, uh, things out there, whether it be clothes or cars. But um, I'm thankful that that just wasn't, you know, part of my parents narrative. I mean, and growing up, um, you know, you, you live within your means, uh, you, you save. Uh, you're generous. Uh, you don't acquire uh, a whole bunch of debt so that you become a, a slave to the lender, which is a biblical uh, principle. Uh, yeah. And I'm grateful for that for that foundation. And I think that that foundation that I was able to have early, um, I, I'm grateful, number one, because I know not a lot of, of people, especially from my background, uh, had an exposure to that. But I'm also grateful that it still works, you know, even to this day, um, you know, in my 40s and now that I have my own family. Awesome. Awesome. So your decision that you made about money in college, was it um, trial and error? I know you touched a lot on, your, you know, your mom, and your dad, the foundation. Um, but um, just again, going through college, I mean, we got stipends back, you know, when I played. And I would imagine, obviously, you guys did as well. But do you have some of those times where you got paid on a? You know, the beginning of the month and second of the month, you're had no more money. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, had, I had plenty of uh, plenty of those instances where things got pretty thin uh, there <laughs> late in the month, and I was uh, checking couch cushions and uh, under the seat in the car, and I can That's remember right. paying for uh, for some Taco Bell and, and 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 some pizza shuttle and all change. I remember handing a, a Ziploc bag <laughs> full of all change through a drive through window. <laughs> uh, once or twice, uh, uh, and so that was uh, those are some pretty pretty humbling experiences, um, you know. But you I learned. Did, yeah, 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 yeah. I did, I did learn, and you know, there are plenty of moments now as I look back and think about, man, if I could have the money, all the money that I spent on Mitchell and Ness jerseys and on speaking <laughs> systems and on rims for my truck, man, I, I'd, be, I'd, I'd like to have that money back. And so there is some buyer's remorse 
you know, when it comes to uh, comes to that. Um, yeah. And then a couple other things that I learned is, uh, you know, even even in some of those moments when, uh, you know, you didn't have a lot coming in as a college student athlete, there were still people that you wanted to help out. You know, there yeah. were still family members or people that you grew up with. And, um, you know, I, I wish that I would have had uh, more of a perspective and a know-how in in a way to help friends and family financially that would be more empowering and less enabling. Meaning, when I had people that reached out to me about finances, whether it was early in college or even once I got into my professional career, um, oftentimes I was quick to want to come to the rescue, right? Because yep. I have the resources and just give the money directly. Well, I didn't know at the time, Pat, that a lot of times when we do that, we're actually enabling that person from their own financial literacy, empowerment, and experience. Yep. Um, uh, I was I was feeding into this dynamic that I heard once uh, that, that's, that describes itself when helping hurts. When you can actually try to help someone by alleviating their financial needs by just giving them money straight up or paying yeah. the bills straight up or giving them cash, you're actually hurting them. You're actually enabling them. And so that was something that uh, that I had to kind of grow out of uh, in the sense of, you know, wanting to be generous, realizing that I'm at a place in time to be able to help friends and family that find themselves in, uh, in dire straits financially, but to make sure that I'm doing it in a way that's empowering them and not not uh, not not enabling them. And then also uh, I found out kind of the hard way because I was so scared of debt. I had no real understanding of the value of credit. Uh, yeah. So meaning when I got into college, um, I got a debit card. Um, and of course, like your first day of college and orientation, all the banks are out there, all the credit unions, all the lenders are out there. Hey, get a card get this and you know this percentage back and all that and I was so scared of credit cards because I didn't I didn't want to go into debt that was just you know something that, that was kind of drilled into me growing up and it protected me you know from spending beyond my means and relying on debt but I didn't know that as soon as I would get out of credit and that I would need to get a car and a, a house and things like I hadn't built up a line of credit even though I had this really good reputation of yep. stewarding finances. And even though I had a real steady job, I was in the league and people You're were talking about, we can't lend you any money, you know, for this, you know, down payment because you don't have any credit. Right. And that, was like, that was something that was completely foreign to me, completely new to me. And so that was one of those areas that I certainly could have used some, some financial literacy early in, in my, in my college, in my, my professional career. Man, that's powerful. Um, yeah, it's again, we just don't realize the power of something like you said, credit and uh, just something else you touched on, uh, which I, I appreciate you being honest on is just, you know, helping others or enabling others, if you will, and not setting them up for uh, success later on, which I can't even imagine, you know, as as someone who's young, being thrust into that situation, and trying to help, but not knowing necessarily how to stop enabling someone so that's um that's tough man that's tough um you kind of touched on this but uh, my next question was what was your worst uh financial decision you made in college and what was your best financial decision i know you mentioned the rims mentioned a couple of jerseys here and there <laughs> yeah uh yeah those, those were certain i certainly had better financial decisions uh than uh than that uh you know there's some people that you know said they were in dire straits. I just gave them straight up cash money, you know, didn't, you know, Hey, you need the bill paid, you know, you're behind on your rent or whatever. Um, you know, uh, and, and even with the expectation of, Hey, I'll pay you back. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think in my mind, I probably had the wrong expectation that that was going to be the case. And I got burned and it hurt the relationship. Um, and, and it was, that was really difficult to mend. Uh, not only did it hurt the relationship, but it also uh, hurt my trust level. Uh, yeah. towards other people uh, when they when they ask for things, uh, you know, that were financially related, uh, even if their scenario was real or true. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I probably would have been a little bit more diligent in, uh, in finding out the, the true means behind that. Um, and instead of, you know, hey, I, I need help with this bill. OK, hey, I'll, I'll pay half. Hey, show me the bill. You know, what is that? Hey, instead of giving you the money directly, uh, hey, I'll, 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 I'll help out and pay directly to, to the light company or the gas company, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, different yeah. things like that. Uh, I would say 
the best thing that I had ever done um, financially when I was in college is really understanding the power of generosity. Um, mm -hmm. No, uh, while I was in college, I became a Christian and I had some older men really take me under their wing and show me, you know, what it meant to be a man of faith. And, you know, it's interesting. The Bible has a lot of things to say uh, about money and, and, and whether someone, you know, believes, you know, in the same, you know, expression of faith that I do, I don't think is, is important at this time, but uh, it is important that the same principles that we find in the Bible around money, they work, uh -huh. uh, they work. And so, yeah. you know, I guess to break it down the, the bare minimum, uh, I had a guy who was mentoring me and that just kind of gave me the, the, the 80, 10, 10 principle. Hey, you live off 80, you save 10 and you give 10. Mm -hmm. And so this was something that was ingrained in me when I barely had anything coming in. You know, maybe I would yep. work a camp, maybe I would have a monthly stipend. But I'm so grateful for that because, number one, I was able to see God's faithfulness that as I was able to try to operate out of a heart of generosity, even when it seemed like I didn't have much, it really developed in me uh, a, a discipline of giving and generosity so that when I ended up having a lot, you know, first round pick, yeah. uh, nothing changed, right? That it was just a discipline in who I was gonna yeah. be, how I was gonna operate. And it's amazing that in that principle, it's better to give than to receive, like the joy and the fulfillment and the satisfaction as you're able to operate generously, especially when you do it in an anonymous way, when you're not getting any credit, I'm telling yeah. you, Pat, it's amazing. You know, it's yeah. amazing. And so I would say that was one of the, the best things that ever happened to me. Uh, and again, it's a way that, that, that my wife and I and our family and even trying to teach our kids, we, we still try to, uh, to operate uh, in that is, uh, is just living, living a generous life. That's awesome, man. That is awesome. Um, a lot of good nuggets, man. A lot of good stuff. Um, so this question here is, uh, and this is kind of the, the main question, if you will, and this is what I would hope that, uh, current student athletes can kind of listen to, but looking back on college, what do you wish you would have done different in regards to dealing with your money? This is the, you know, looking back at, Young Simeon, like what I would wish I would have done different. Yeah, well, if um, anything. yeah, no, I would, I would, I mean, there, there's some things that, that I would do different just in terms of, uh, you know, when I, and I alluded to it earlier, you know, mm -hmm. those, those jerseys and those rims and those, <laughs> and that speaker system, it's so interesting that during that small window of my life, you know, mm -hmm. two, two to four years, how so much of that was driven to impress people that I would never really interact with or that I would never really see again for the rest of my life. And, uh, and yeah. uh, on, on this side of it, it, it's pretty sobering, you know, it's pretty, pretty humbling. Like, wow, I did all that. I, I put all that effort towards trying to impress people that probably didn't even notice anyways, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, Wow, what a, what what a waste! Um, yeah. But transposing, you know, kind of my my college career into into what it would be like today, mm -hmm. um, especially when we consider NIL, um, which I'm very excited about. I am yeah. I'm elated about NIL. I know that it's it's a it's a it's a new space to navigate. I know mm -hmm. that it's uh, operating in a way that seems counterintuitive for a lot of people. Sure, there's some trappings and some pitfalls that are there, but I don't think there are new trappings and pitfalls that 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 uh, that haven't been uh, something that student athletes uh, have had to navigate, you know, up until this point. Mm -hmm. um, think about that. Um, and I, one of the reasons why I'm excited about NIL is because I fully believe that it is connected with higher education, 100. percent And this yeah. this is why. So when student athletes come to uh, a campus, uh, they're on academic pursuit at some capacity and they have choices and what that academic pursuit is going to be like. And I know in my case, I was looking to choose an academic pursuit of something that was going to be applicable uh, right away. Mm -hmm. Sadly, at the time, 
because I didn't have a lot of financial resources, because I wasn't interested in a lot of business, I kind of deviated away from a lot of the courses and curriculum that were business centric. Right. Well, now thinking about NIL, when student athletes are in charge of their own brand and their own personal financing, now one of the things that NIL does is it exposes student athletes to the need and the, and the direct application to a lot of what the, that business curriculum has a chance to offer you. And yeah. so for me, it's like, look, I'm here to play ball. I'm here to graduate. I want the path of least resistance when it comes to a degree. Well, yeah. now thinking about it, if I were to be a student athlete in 2022, it's like, well, wait a minute, got NIL, I got a brand to manage and I got finances, you know, that I need to steward. You know what? That accounting class, that marketing class, yeah. that macroeconomics class, that microeconomics, like, oh, I need all that. Hey, 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 yeah. so I need a counselor, <laughs> I need all that. I'm, I'm applying that. it right now. I'm applying it. Direct application. You know, hey, I, I'll go to summer school for that too as well. Yeah. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I'm excited. And I think we're even kind of starting to see it in some of the circles that I operate in is like, whoa, these guys are actually adjusting their course curriculum. They're actually elevating it because of NIL, because they've got real time application, you know, to that. And so, um, you know, think of back to my time, I probably would have been more proactive, you know, with that when it came to my academic course load and, and emphasis and, and certainly would do that now because we have more exposure to, to, to NIL and everyone's basically in charge of their, their own personal brand. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm, I know we've talked obviously off, uh, off campus, but it's, it's such a, a very interesting topic and I agree hundred percent with you. It's, it's definitely going to force them to take those classes, apply them as they're taking those classes. So, uh, creates a very unique opportunity for a lot and hopefully a lot of these, these guys can uh, take advantage of it. Um, I got two more questions, one, and then just a bonus question. Um, so what are some of the pitfalls you hope that your story would prevent? Um, or could prevent to young student athletes out there. So young current student athletes that are li listening and watching now, what would you want them to glean? Yeah, um, I, I would say two things that I hope they would glean from. Uh, number one, be in the comparison game. Like uh, I, I heard a, it's an incredible quote and it, it, it applies to, to so many different areas of your life and, and it's this. The, the, the comparison game is the game that everyone plays and that no one wins. Okay? <laughs> the comparison game is the game that everyone plays, but no one wins. And Undefeated. So, pointing back to my own uh, pitfalls and mistakes that I've made, so much <laughs> of my you know financial mistakes that I've made in the past, and even some that I've made here recently, have been mm -hmm. because I'm comparing myself to others. Yeah. Have been out of a insecurity of, man, what do people think about me? You know, what do they think about the type of clothes that I have on, the type of car that I drive? And it's not a healthy way to operate. And uh, and that's why buyer's remorse exists. That's why <laughs> buyer's remorse is a real thing. That's why companies, you know, continue to come out with the latest, greatest model every single year because they know that people are going to get caught up in this spiral of needing the newest Thing. And so I would yeah. say to the best of your ability, hey, be exactly who you are and don't get caught up in that in that comparison game. Um, and then uh, and then the sec second thing I would say is, is just don't don't operate out of a fear of lack. Uh, yeah. Fear of lack means that, oh, oh, man, there's not enough resources to go around. You know, um, you know, I have to, you know, operate and to live in a way where I can't be generous or I've got a side hustle. Or I've got to, you know, find out what's the next get rich quick scheme, and I got to be the first to get in on that. Um, I don't know if I've seen a lot of fruit from that uh, in my life or in the lives of, of other people around me. I don't know how many high capacity people uh, that I know uh, in terms of high capacity, not merely in financial, but I'm talking about in quality of life, which yeah. has a significant value. I actually think quality of life has more value than quantity of wealth, yeah. hello? Yeah. Yes. I mean, not, listen yes. to me, I'm, I'm gonna say that again. Quality of life has a higher value than quantity of wealth. Like, so oh my gosh. understand that. Yeah. Um, 
know if I've seen a lot of high capacity people in both of those categories operate out of a fear of lack or operate out of a out of a hustle and bustle mentality. Now, I don't want to diminish the the importance of having a work ethic, you know, right. the importance of being diligent, you know, the importance of having a, a resilient, the importance of, of responding to failure, right? Because right. there's going to be business endeavors, there's going to be uh, investment opportunities, there are going to be purchases that we make that, hey, we're going to fail, right? Yeah. Um, but I think it's important to make sure that, that, that we're able to, to bounce back from that uh, mm -hmm. and to make sure that we're not operating out of, out of a fear of lack um, in a way that causes us to, to operate in a detriment um, to ourselves, you know, personally, mentally, spiritually, health-wise also, mm -hmm. uh, but then also the, the people around us to where we are, are operating, you know, out of character or in a way that isn't, isn't integrous um, you know, in, in our business dealings, but also in our personal relationships uh, with one another. Man, you hit that on the head. I, I tell you what, um, quality of life. I've mentioned that I don't know how many times to to friends, uh, you know, my wife. Uh, it's, it's all about the quality of life. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're making millions and millions of dollars. It's about your quality of life. Um, so mm, you hit on the head with that one, man. So uh, bonus question. So uh, obviously, you know, most guys that, that play sports in college, they want to make it to the next level, the pro level, whatever sport that may be. And so, uh, you, you obviously were one of the fortunate ones that, that have, uh, that did. And so what would you say as far as, um, how did you feel making that significant amount of money? How did it affect you? Uh, were you able to, uh, obviously, look back and what your parents have taught you is from a foundation standpoint, you know, that, and what would you want, you know, young people that have aspirations to make it to the next level? How would you kind of, again, kind of speak to that uh, with them as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and for those uh, young men and women who, you know, aspire to, to play at the, at the highest level, man, I, I would encourage them to do so. Um, I would share with them the reality that uh, how difficult it's going to be. Um, I'm sure they all know the percentages, you know, out there. It is, uh, you know, the elite of the elite, you know, have the opportunity to, to do this uh, as, a, as a career. Um, and I hope that many of them get a chance to experience it. Um, it's going to take an immense amount of work. It's going to take them uh, humbling themselves and receiving an immense amount of coaching uh, mm -hmm. and criticism. <laughs> um, you know, there's going to be, you know, failure that they're going to have to push through. Uh, it's one thing to be able to get to that level. It's another thing to be able to stay at that level. Uh, mm -hmm. Look, I had a cup of coffee in the league. I was only there for three years. <laughs> you know, it was done basically when I was, I don't know, 26, 27. Yeah. Um, so it was a very short lived window. But I would say um, to them, whether you make it or not, the mm -hmm. one of the values in sports is that some of the principles and the dynamics that you get a chance to learn are transferable to every single part of your life for your entire life. For me, the value has less to do about the resume that you read off, all American this, first round draft pick that, like that was nice, but there's not a lot of value in that right now. Because you know what? When my wife needs me to come home and be a good husband, <laughs> she don't care how many points yeah, I score. You know, in the she doesn't care at all. When when my daughter needs me to help her learn how to drive, and I gotta provide for a car and some insurance for her, she doesn't yeah. care that you know how many rebounds and how many double. Like that stuff is irrelevant. But you know what? The things that I learned from sport, teamwork, work ethic, resilience. Mm -hmm responding to failure, like all of those type of things, that is where the real value is. And because that's where the real value is, you have an opportunity to monetize off those things over your entire life. Old, mm -hmm. washed up, 40 years old, can't play ball anymore, right? The basketball mm -hmm. skills that I used to have and maybe the small amount that I still do possess in terms of you know being able to make a few free throws, I can't monetize that anymore, right? Mm -hmm. but you know right. what? all those principles and characteristics and leadership qualities that I learned under playing for three Hall of Fame coaches and being a part of high performing teams, that still has value. Yep. Value of my character, 
has value in my parenting, but also you can monetize that because you know what? One of the reasons why I have the job that I have today ain't got nothing yeah. to do with my career that I did putting the ball on the hoop a long time ago, but it has a lot to do with those characteristics and qualities that I can still operate in. And everybody has access to that. Might not have access to playing power five. Might not have access to having your name being called by the commissioner, but we've got access to those characteristics and qualities. And it's up to you how to activate them. Absolutely, man. Um, you know, I tell my wife and my, my daughters, I was a D1 athlete all the time, and it doesn't seem to, they never care. They never care. I don't, I don't get it. I don't know. But anyway, um, well, man, um, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your time immensely. Um, if you could just tell, you know, everyone what you've been doing now, you know, since you obviously, you know, retired from ball, you know, at the University of Kansas, what, what is Wayne Simeon doing now? Yeah, yeah. So I finished up my, my playing family. career. Yeah, yeah. No, I finished up with my, my playing career and uh, transitioned into campus ministry and mentoring. And so uh, my wife and I uh, helped direct a campus ministry named Call the Greatness for uh, 13 years, which operated on campuses kind of all across the Midwest. And, and so it was great to be able to serve uh, the college student population and, and helping them uh, be able to uh, to grow and to flourish uh, in, in faith and in all things in life. Uh, and then during that time, I still had a high exposure to the world of college athletics and working with teams and coaches and being around uh, in that dynamic. And so uh, most recently, I just transitioned into uh, the world of college athletics as associate athletic director of engagement and outreach uh, here at my alma mater, the University of Kansas. And so it's basically a fancy title for someone that does a little bit of everything, uh, <laughs> uh, which is great because I'm taking care of home, still highly involved in engaging and working with students, but I'm also on the executive staff. I also do some fundraising. I also get a chance to tackle some of this uh newness on the NIL space. And so it's a pretty, pretty yeah. exciting time. And uh, I've been married for 16 years uh, to my wife, Katie. We've got five amazing kids uh, that range from 14 to eight. Uh, they're active, uh, do a ton of uh, youth coaching, uh, mainly uh, youth basketball uh, for my three sons. And then uh, hobby wise, I lo love the outdoors. Uh, so really enjoy uh, fishing and hunting. And, uh, and still highly involved uh, in, in the faith community uh, here uh, in Lawrence, but also also nationally and and, uh, and beyond. So it's been been great. My man. Well, I appreciate. Like I said, I appreciate you taking the time. I feel good now. I can I can rest for 2022. I got one you sent me. <laughs> uh, this was fun, man. Thanks so much for for inviting me on. And um, yeah, I don't know about the uh, uh, the listeners or the audience, but I'm so thankful for Pat and the efforts that he's putting forward um, towards providing this, this, uh, this research and or this, uh, this resource. Uh, and I think, you know, even though there may be some student athletes or, or other folks operating on different campuses, uh, I want to be a resource myself. So even if you're not a Jayhawk or if you're not around the Midwest, um, you know, you can reach out to me uh, via email or social media. I'm, I'm happy to uh, expound upon some of the things that I shared about uh, during this brief time, or just to see you, uh, growing this skill, like you mm -hmm. said, Pat, it's the skill, the skill yes, of, uh, of financial literacy. Absolutely. All right, man. I'll let you go. It was good talking with you, brother. All right, man. Appreciate it, Pat. We'll see you later. Yep. Oops. How do I get out of this?